All righty. Well, hey, how's it going? I'm super excited to be hanging out with, I, I think, a new friend. We haven't had a chance to catch up before, but Anuj, Anuj Sony. I'm trying to get your name right and feel like I'm going to butcher it every time. But thanks so much me. for letting me spend some time with you here. But how are you doing, my friend? How What's going on in your world? <laughs> really good, John. Super excited to uh, finally meet you. Congrats, by the way, on the, the million subs. Huge accomplishment, really, in awe of your throughput on YouTube. Uh, but yeah, man, super excited to finally get a chance to chat with you. Well, if there are any folks tuning in that just don't happen to know who you are or what you're up to, but you have a YouTube channel just as well. You're, you're showcasing incredible, absolute wizardry, low-level deep knowledge with a whole lot of binary work and malware. If you don't mind, I'd love for you to just, I don't know, color the picture on who you are, what you're up to. Yeah, sure, John. I, I appreciate it. I, I'm uh, what I like to consider a baby YouTuber. So yeah, I have uh, recently started a channel, only got a handful of videos up there, still working on getting that solid cadence down. But so far, really enjoyed putting out content focused on malware analysis and uh, would love for people to, to check it out. But outside of that, uh, I'm a principal threat researcher at BlackBerry, where I perform uh, malware reverse engineering to support incident response and product improvement, uh, and also to kind of support my own research, uh, which of course is one topic of which we'll be talking about today. Uh, in addition to that, I'm also a SANS author and instructor. So I co-author the uh, FOR 610 reverse engineering malware course, and I also relatively recently authored the FOR 710 Advanced Reverse Engineering Malware Course. Dang, my friend. Those are some incredible, incredible accolades. Uh, but hey, I know you have some tricks up your sleeve. I was super excited. You were kind of teasing with a little bit of uh, some demos, some fireworks, some show and tell. Uh, so whatever you're up for, my friend, please take it away. <laughs> Absolutely, John. So just to set the stage a little bit, as I mentioned, I'm a malware reverse engineer. I'm a malware analyst. And one of the most time consuming parts about that job, and sometimes one of the most challenging, is dealing with obfuscation, right? The reality, as you know, John, is that most strings, configuration information, uh, next stage executable content, whether it's an entire executable in memory or maybe shell code, uh, most of that is now obfuscated in malware. And so as a malware analyst, uh, one of my first tasks generally when I encounter that sort of obfuscation is to get at that underlying information. I want to know what those strings are, what that config data is. What is that next stage that either is embedded in that original loader or maybe downloaded from a C2 server? And not only that, but ideally, I would love for whatever uh, obfuscation I discover, I would love to be able to deobfuscate that in some sort of a scalable automated way. So typically, a lot of reverse engineers will create, for example, a standalone Python script, right? That will go ahead and open that file. It'll programmatically find those strings or that config data, and then it will implement the algorithm, whatever it might be, uh, in order to actually automatically deobfuscate that information. And that certainly works. That's, that's a great approach. Uh, the challenge, though, is that uh, sometimes you encounter algorithms that are very custom and that might be significantly challenging to, one, understand, and then actually implement in your own Python script. And so an alternative to that typical approach I wanted to talk about today is binary emulation. And when I refer to emulation, I'm talking about essentially simulating the execution of instructions. So rather than executing those instructions on the CPU, we're going to rely on a software framework, an emulation framework, to actually execute those instructions. And that means that framework is responsible, for example, uh, keeping track of arguments and variables and uh, whatever values are being populated in the registers during execution. And the benefit of using an approach like emulation is that we can very surgically and very precisely execute parts of the program. So we can tell it to execute specific instructions or an entire function. And if we find the function that is likely responsible for, for deobfuscation, for example, we can actually use the malware against itself. Rather than worrying about implementing the algorithm to decode or decrypt, we can use the code in the sample itself to perform that deobfuscation. Man, that is so cool. And I am super excited to see it in action. I want to learn uh, anything you can kind of, I'd like to level up. I'd like to learn and figure out and learn how to do this myself. Uh, so please, uh, I'm excited here. <laughs> cool. All right. So let me uh, go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Awesome. So just a couple caveats before I really dig into this. First off, I don't want to pretend like emulation is a silver bullet here, right? Uh, implementing a Python script, let's say, for emulation can be significantly challenging. So I'm going to stress several times that I would really only, only encourage you to use this sort of approach 
if you're talking about a deobfuscation algorithm, uh, that is sufficiently challenging to actually understand and implement. But if you're open to it, uh, I think you'll find that this is a very useful approach among others uh, to kind of have at your disposal when performing reverse engineering. Uh, second caveat is, is that there will certainly be some code that everyone will be exposed to here. Hopefully uh, people are excited about that. We'll see some x86, we'll see some x64, uh, we'll do some static code analysis in Ghidra, and we'll also do some debugging in x64 debug, and finally dig into some of the actual Python code that takes advantage of some of these emulation frameworks to actually do the dirty work for us. All right, so let's go ahead and dig into this. Now, as an introduction to emulation, you know, first off, I, I also want to say I don't want this to be a, a discussion of theory. I want to get as quickly as possible into the practical application here. But I do have to introduce just a couple things. And the first thing I want to mention is Unicorn, all right? So unicorns aren't just for kids. Uh, the Unicorn framework is a CPU emulator. All right, and this is really the building block for just about every other emulation framework that is currently out there. It, it being a CPU emulator, what that means is it basically is really good at executing instructions. It, however, has no awareness of the operating system. It doesn't know what a Windows API is. It doesn't know what file types are, right? It doesn't know what a portable executable file is or an ELF binary. So it is a little bit limited uh, in that way, but that is why these other frameworks have kind of come out building upon the success of Unicorn. However, I do want to start with Unicorn and show you how you can even use just Unicorn without its operating system or file type awareness, uh, but taking advantage of its Python bindings to perform some basic deobfuscation. So John, I'm going to jump over here straight into this, this demo here. Um, what I've done to save us a little bit of time is I have loaded a few pieces of malware into Ghidra, and I know you've done some great videos on Ghidra, so if folks need to, some background, definitely encourage you to check out some of other John, some of John's other videos there. But the first sample I'm going to talk about here, you'll see that it's, uh, it has the, the letters FBI at the beginning here, which is a hint, perhaps, at what we're about to look at. Uh, John, I know you did a video on this as well. Back in August, as your listeners may know, the FBI did a quote, you know, takedown of a Clackbot, in quotes, of course, because that sort of action is oftentimes pretty temporary. But nonetheless, uh, they attempted to do a takedown of Quackbot. And what that involved was essentially sending some shellcode to all infected machines where that shellcode was responsible for actually uninstalling that instance of Quackbot. I actually do a deeper dive into this uh, in one of my uh, videos on my YouTube channel. Uh, but for now, what I want to just touch on is a basic obfuscation technique that perhaps some of you have seen before. So I'm really just at the beginning of the shellcode here, and I'm scrolling down, and perhaps some of you... Uh, already getting a hint at what obfuscation technique we're talking about because we just saw a ton of variables on the stack here. But as I scroll down, I encounter a series of move instructions, right? And we have move instructions, which are taking values in uh, various registers, placing them on the stack. Uh, you also see some hexadecimal values here, which about one or more bytes. And if I arrow over these, you'll see that in most cases, they actually seem to correlate with uh, some characters, right? So again, you're probably already getting a hint that perhaps we're talking about a common obfuscation technique here called stack strings, which is where strings are dynamically built during execution on the stack. And this is an obfuscation technique because it will create the string it needs during execution. But if you were to just run strings against this file, you wouldn't see it because the bytes that contribute to the string are actually scattered across all of these instructions. And because these are instructions, you'll see here on the left-hand side, there are bytes that are also associated uh, with the actual code. So that's why we wouldn't actually see a complete string, but during execution, it would certainly reveal itself. So a question then is, all right, how do we go about actually getting access to that deobfuscated string? And there are multiple ways to do it. Uh, you could, for example, go ahead and, I don't know, manually copy out some of these bytes, but you'll see many of them are gonna be populated at runtime. You could use a debugger, that could work. Now it is shell code, so using a debugger is just slightly more complicated, but it certainly can work. Uh, that would be another approach. Uh, but the approach I wanna, of course, demonstrate here right now is emulation. And we're gonna use Unicorn, which means that we can execute very specific instructions and then take a look at what is happening in memory. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm basically gonna grab all of these bytes, right, that are associated with these move instructions. And you'll see that uh, there's quite a few they go all the way down here to this call instruction. So I'm going to go ahead and just start collecting these. And I'm really just gonna go 
to the top of the function, right? Just to make sure that I got everything. I mean, I could be a little bit more surgical, maybe just grabbing up until here. But as you can see, there are some moves up here as well. So just to be completely safe, I'm gonna go to the top of this function. And then I'm gonna right click and go to copy special. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, grab the byte string and press okay. So it's just cap capturing basically these opcodes on the left-hand side. All right, <clears throat> so now I got those that, that byte string essentially, uh, I have access to it. I'm gonna now go over here to VS Code. And as I mentioned, there's gonna be a, a decent amount of Python code in our discussion today. And don't worry, uh, I will walk through exactly what this code does. So you'll see at the beginning of this code, we have a few imports, right? And these imports, as you can tell, are all associated with uh, Unicorn, which is the framework that we're starting off with here. Next, I have a variable that I wanna populate with my shell code. And I just wanna take that, uh, basically that hex string converted into bytes. Now I'm gonna go ahead and just paste that here. And you can start to see, and you will see as I proceed through these demos that once you create some initial scripts to do the dirty work for you, right? This is obviously not something you have to write each and every time. Uh, for example, if I'm emulating shell code that uses stack strings, this, this script will work for, for all of those uh, examples. All right, so now using Unicorn, I need to initialize the emulator. And this is basically the command you would use to do that. I'm basically telling it, hey, we're working with x86 32-bit code. Now, one downside with Unicorn compared to some of the other frameworks we'll talk about is that it's really good at what it does, but it does need quite a bit of information to get going. And by that, I mean you need to allocate memory for anything that you're going to execute. And you actually need to allocate memory even for the stack, right? Which is a structure in memory where we'll find the arguments and variables and so on. And since we are demonstrating how to deobfuscate the stack strings technique, we're definitely going to need a stack here. So this code that I have here basically chooses an address for the stack and a size. And you might ask, well, why did I choose these specific addresses? It really doesn't matter what you choose unless it's as, as long as it's a 32-bit address and you know, of reasonable stack size. So this is basically like my default. And then I might uh, maybe increase the size if I get some sort of memory error later on while trying to actually run this. But the bottom line is we just need an address, we need a size. And then this mem map method is responsible for actually allocating the memory. So this will do the job of allocating memory for the stack. But we're not done just yet with our setup. Now we need to specify ESP. So some of you may know ESP, the stack pointer, it points to the top of the stack as arguments are pushed onto the stack or popped off the stack. And so essentially I need to populate ESP. So my strategy for doing this, and this is what others uh, in the field do as well, is I basically take the stack size and I divide it by two and I add it to the stack address, which basically puts me somewhere in the middle. And the reason I do that is just so I have a little bit of room, right, to go up and down in terms of my ESP uh, uh, address without worrying about going into a location that is, is not allocated. Uh, and then I basically write that to the ESP register, at least the, the register as it's tracked by Unicorn, using the mu.regwrite uh, method. I also need to perform this sort of allocation for the code. Whoops, let me go back a little bit here. There we go. I need to do this for the code. So again, I choose an address, I choose a size, and then I map some memory for the code. Obviously you need to map enough for this code. So that is more than enough. And then I use memwrite to now place the code that I referenced earlier on when I had converted that uh, hex string to bytes. And I just place it into the address that I've allocated uh, in memory. And next I'm ready to now emulate this code. Now, what you will see is both in Unicorn and in Killing or really any other framework, when you emulate code, uh, you have to specify generally a start and an end address. So what are you trying to emulate? Uh, it's best to be surgical when using emulation frameworks as opposed to just executing an entire program. And so my start address is really where my code is located. And the end address is just, oh, if I take that start address and add the length of my shell code, that's gonna be my end address. And then I'm just gonna start my emulation. So this is really all you need in Unicorn to get started with emulation. Next, for the purposes of understanding the stack string, I'm going to read using mem underscore read. I'm gonna read from the stack. And then I just wanna see what strings are located there. Now I have some code here at the bottom uh, that extracts UTF-8 and UTF-16 strings. I'm not gonna talk about the details here because I'm quite confident many of you watching this video right now could come up with something better. <laughs> but the bottom line is it basically extracts UTF-8 and UTF-16 strings uh, from all that memory that I've allocated for the stack. And then it prints it out. So that's basically it. Now, can I, I actually ask, 
yeah, super yeah, duper sorry. It. I don't want to interrupt. Uh, no, everything please. just about until line 30 is kind of your boilerplate, right? You say, hey, this is just kind of everything that you usually need to run and work with Unicorn. Uh, yes. Just yes. all that. Make sure you got a stack. Make sure you got a stack pointer. Plop the code in. So that's pretty much copy pasta for almost all of your Unicorn scripts. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, that has worked uh, for the most part. And yeah, the rest after line 30 is really, or af yeah, after line 30 is focused on this specific application. Now, I mean, I should add all these methods have some more details, some optional arguments right. you could add to get more specific about the permissions you're assigning to memory and so on. But I wanted to make uh, this as simple as possible. And, and this this is very functional. Yeah, I mean, even just, oh, sure, 30 lines with white space and comments, that's pretty easy. And then I'm excited to see what Killing and some of the others do, but we can fire it up. I'm excited to pull out these stack strings. <laughs> yeah, so let me go ahead and now run this code. Well, first off, let me save this. Otherwise, oh. it's not going to do much. And now let me go ahead and run this code. And what we'll see here are the uh, basically the stack strings that it was able to extract. Nice. Uh, where are we here? There we go. And so, you know, we have virtual outlook, load library, virtual protect, we got get native system info, you know, and, and a few others here. Um, and you'll see in some cases, they're kind of jam packed together. That's just how they appeared on the stack, which is why uh, my script shows it like that. But of course you could proceed to kind of clean this up a little bit. Um, but yeah, so that's one approach to using emulation to just execute instructions, right? There were no windows APIs involved here, just very simple stack strings. And in this case, it gave us the, the information we needed. Can I ask maybe another cheesy question, but I know this will give us those string values. Is there any way, or are we kind of getting way too far into the weeds where could, could we tell, oh, even what address this got set for the rest of that program's execution, just so we know what is referring to kernel 32.dll or get native system info. Is there a way to track oh, where it actually kind of gets stored and then later referenced or not with this implementation? You could, but the challenge again is that as you start to proceed, uh, you know, pass through this script, right. it will call functions that call Windows APIs, mm. and that's where the challenge is uh, with Unicorn is that you can't really be messing with Windows APIs. I mean, let me rephrase that: you could, but it's a very heavy lift. And now that we have frameworks like the one we'll talk about next, which is Killing, which are operating system aware, which are file type aware, to me, it's a no-brainer to use that kind of framework for to answer your question, right? Cool. To, to take on that more complex task. I give you a perfect segue. That works. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Cool. All right. So in this last example, we dealt with uh, uh, stack strings here. Let me go ahead and close this one down because we are now going to tap, tackle another common use case. And just to mix things up a bit, right now we just looked at some Windows shell code. Let's actually now look at an ELF binary. So I have a binary already loaded up here uh, called XOR DDoS. That's the family it belongs to, as you can guess from the name, it involves uh, the XOR uh, operation. And its purpose is to, uh, well, one of its purposes is to basically perform DDoS attacks. But, uh, and, and another thing I want to emphasize, by the way, is that, as you might guess, we are going to emulate portions of this code. And this is an ELF binary. And if you haven't noticed, I'm on a Windows VM. So that's mm -hmm. another beauty of emulation, right? I can effectively run, uh, I can effectively run uh, uh, Linux code here within my Windows VM, which is pretty nice. So, all right, so we've already hopped to kind of a portion of this code here. And, uh, you know, just for those who haven't done a lot of code analysis here, or maybe you haven't seen Ghidra in a bit, uh, just a brief intro, obviously, we got the disassembly here in the center. This is the listing display. On the right-hand side, we got our decompiler output, which I won't be making a whole lot of use of here today, but uh, certainly very helpful to have uh, when you do in-depth reverse engineering. You don't want to rely upon it, but it can definitely support and expedite your analysis. Um, so. When I'm looking at some code, my eyes, and I think the eyes of most reverse engineers, will kind of quickly draw to the call instruction. Okay, so the call instruction is like one of the easiest to understand uh, because it calls a function. And as a malware analyst, we're very interested in functions, especially those that were created by the malware developer, because typically that means this code will be executed you know, one or more times. And uh, functions usually have a purpose, and understanding that purpose can contribute to our understanding, of course, of the entire sample. Now, as I scroll up here, you'll see that there are multiple references to this function called dec underscore conf. And some of you might be saying, hold on a second, why are those functions named, right? Like typically when we open up some code, we don't have the luxury of named functions. Well, it just so happened that in this elf binary, symbols were not stripped, which means that we have access to all of the functions defined by the developer. 
Now, I'm not going to use that as too much of a crutch, uh, but it is certainly a nice to have whenever it does show up. Now, this function is called deck underscore conf. And if we were to like dive into it, let me just double click on one of these instances. We'll see that there is a uh, mem move in here. And there's also a function called encrypt code. Hey, I wonder what that does. Right. Well, if we double click on this function just to get a quick glance, we'll see that, uh, well, it's not very large for starters. And what you might see on the left-hand side is this visual cue, this dotted line that kind of jumps from down here up to the top. It turns out this is a loop, okay? So we got a conditional kind of uh, evaluation here that will occasionally jump back here uh, up higher in the code. And you'll see in it is a series of instructions. We got some uh, divide instructions, XOR instructions. And these are kind of the hallmarks of a loop that probably does do some sort of decoding. So on quick glance, and we also have a reference here to XOR keys. Mm -hmm. uh, on quick glance, it does look like this is some sort of a decoding or encoding function. All right. Now, let me go back to where I came from by hitting this back button. Now, another way to kind of confirm that, hey, not only do we have four instances here, but it's probably called more than that, is in Ghidra, if I right-click and go to References and go to Show References 2, right, I see uh, 13, <laughs> so a lot of my multiple references, right, yeah. to this function call. Kind of supports the idea this is probably doing something interesting. Now, the question, of course, is, well, what is it decoding, right? What is it actually doing? Well, when I want to understand what arguments are being passed to a call being made, I generally look at the instructions above it. And we'll see that there are only four instructions above this previous call or above this call to deck underscore conf. And then at that point, we get to a previous call to the same function, right? So these probably contribute to passing arguments to this function. And you can see, although if we were to kind of take a little peek on the right-hand side, you'll see, yes, those are, in fact, the arguments that are being passed to this function. And you'll notice one of them, this dat location, this label, refers to an address in memory. And if we double click there to go there, looks like we got a bunch of bytes that, at least on the surface, don't look like they make a whole lot of sense. It doesn't look mm -hmm. like a string I can read. It doesn't even look like the opcodes associated with common instructions. So this is probably what's being decoded, right? Uh, and if you were to go to all of the other references for deck underscore conf, that turns out to be the case too. You got kind of a blob like this. All right, so we've identified that this function probably does some decoding. We even just, at least in one case, understand that it's probably decoding you know, this argument that's being passed, which is like the second argument uh, that's being passed to this instruction. How do we actually get at the underlying content, all of these you know, decoded values? Well, one approach is we could go over to Linux. Maybe I could execute this program, dump memory, take a look at the strings, but that's a little bit messy, not very precise. I could use GDB. Uh, to go ahead and debug this, which could work. But the problem sometimes with debugging is that oftentimes, well, not often, but certainly sometimes, you'll encounter situations where you try to get to a certain function or a address in the code, and it just never arrives there. Maybe there's anti-analysis capabilities built in. Maybe it's corrupted. Maybe there's some other situation, some scenario you're not taking into account. So of course, what I'm getting at here is let's explore the use of emulation, okay? Oh, and by the way, you know, you could try to create a standalone Python script that implements uh, the algorithm, which isn't overly complex in this case. Uh, but then you got to programmatically identify all the strings, right? So you got to pull those out, find them in the file, pull them out, implement the algorithm. Again, to me, it seems like a bit more work than is necessary. And when you learn about the power of emulation, you'll find that in some cases, it is quite a bit easier, especially as the algorithm gets sufficiently complex. So let's now use emulation. Now, when I'm using emulation for a situation like this, rather than tackle all of these references to deck underscore conf uh, and then take a look at what it deobfuscates, I usually start off with just one. And the one I'm going to start off with is right here. And I have a little note to myself here in the comments. <laughs> use this, this one. one. <laughs> right, just to make sure that that's the one that I look at. All right, there we go. So just to clarify that, that was not an auto-generated comment. That's the only thing I added uh, to this interface here. All right, so this is the one, as you could tell, that I'm, uh, I'm going to go ahead and try and understand, which means I want to deobfuscate whatever this points to. Well, just like with Unicorn, I need to ask myself the question, what's the start address and what's the end address that I want to emulate? Start address here, 
pretty pretty obvious, I think, in that, well, we know we need these arguments, and right here is another call to deck underscore comp. So this is going to be our start address, this address ending with 0c3. Now, what's the end address? And I should say up front, you know, it does take some trial and error to get good at spotting a good start and end address. Uh, you have to understand kind of the limitations of these frameworks, and that's also why I'm going through a variety of samples to kind of give you exposure to that. So one approach is, well, I could make my end address this one. In other words, the uh, instruction right after deck underscore comp. But that really only works for one run, right? One deobfuscation. And as much as possible, especially when you're dealing with the end address, you typically can choose something that provides a bit more flexibility. And what do I mean by that? Well, if I dive it back into this function here, I noticed earlier that we saw a call to encrypt code. And if you were to dive into this function and you would just take a peek at it, you would see that it populates EAX, which is often the return register, populates it basically with a pointer, right? And so what I could do is make my end address this one right here. And that would suffice as an end address, even in the future, when I want to deobfuscate all strings, that's an end address that could work for every reference to deck underscore conf. So I'm actually going to choose this one as the end address. All right, so we've chosen a start address, and we've chosen an end address. Well, I mentioned that Unicorn is great, but it has some limitations. So I'm going to take this opportunity to use a more robust framework here. And the framework we're going to use now is called Killing. Okay, so Killing is a binary emulation framework uh, similar to Unicorn. But as I hinted at earlier, it is operating system aware. It is file type aware. And that means it does know what a Windows API is. And it takes care of a lot of the memory allocation stuff in the background as well. So we don't have to worry about that like we did with uh, Unicorn. Uh, so this is the main site for killing. Um, well, I guess this is the main site for killing here. And if you want to go to its GitHub, obviously, you can click on this link here. Uh, I do want to mention from an installation perspective, I've obviously already installed it in Windows. But if I click installation here, it's really just as simple as running this pip command right here. Uh, if you're going to emulate Windows programs uh, with killing, it is important to read all these instructions in detail. For example, there's an important note here for Windows emulation. Basically, it doesn't come packaged. It's not allowed to come packaged <laughs> with all Windows DLLs. So it's got a that file that you can run to collect the necessary Windows DLLs. Okay, so just kind of read the inst installation instructions, of course, if you want to uh, get this working. And the page that I had shown earlier, this comparison page, by the way, I'm not going to go over all this now, but definitely check it out if you're interested in understanding how Killing compares to well, even Unicorn, which I've already kind of explained, or other uh, well-known frameworks out there like Speakeasy, uh, Dumpulator, right? There are lots of other frameworks out there that you could consider using and definitely encourage you to kind of give this a read to better understand that. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to use Killing to emulate this one reference to deck underscore conf. And let me show you the code that we'll need to use to do that. So this is this is really it, right? 17 Ooh. lines here. Yeah. And uh, what you'll see here is first we got our import associated with killing. Then we need to initialize killing. Now, when you initialize killing, you of course need to provide it with the path to the actual binary. In this case, it's an elf binary right here. And uh, the, these are kind of the recommended kind of paths to have for various binaries. So again, the documentation has a lot of this information. Then you have to specify the root FS. So it's the root file system, the really the starting point, uh, the root directory from which emulation is going to be performed. And so I have mine at this location right here. And uh, that's just, again, something you need to provide when you use killing. And then this right here, this command actually initializes killing. You'll see the sample path is in a list because you can supply command line arguments as part of that list if you like, although here we don't need to. Now, one caveat here, otherwise, right, this, this code would have been like almost 10 lines. But one caveat here I do need to mention. I discovered while experimenting with killing that when, it, when you are emulating uh, on Windows, because we're on Windows here, uh, when you're emulating an ELF binary, for some reason, although it does a great job of taking care of memory and, and ESP, it did not automatically populate EBP. I'm not quite sure why that was the case, but it basically populated it with a value of zero, and that results in uh, the emulation failing. So what these two lines do right here is basically give EBP a starting point. And all I do is I'm reading in the current value of ESP, which was assigned appropriately, and I'm writing it to EBP, 
EBP, the base pointer, should also point to the stack. So I just gave it the value of ESP, and this has generally worked just fine for me. So again, minor detail that I just include in all of my killing scripts like this, and uh, it ends up uh, fixing that particular issue. And then we're just going to run the code, right? So this is the start address that I, I referenced to Ghidra, and this is the end address. And that's really all we need. After that, once that function is emulated, I then want to read the contents of EAX, and then I'm just going to dereference the string located uh, at that at that location. So let's that go ahead now. Too and easy. That's so simple. <laughs> it is right. Yeah. Now you might you might take that back when you see the next script. But True. for now, it is right. I mean, for for demonstrating and for trying emulation initially, uh, I find it after you know writing a few scripts to be quite approachable. So let's now go ahead and uh, and run this. I'm going to go to run code here. And there we go. So we got one Ooh. deobfuscated string, which references a raw file, which is pretty interesting. Mm. Um, and we just proved that basically that function does in fact do the decoding and that emulation worked in this case. All that right. is so awesome. awesome. Yeah, we got a great starting point. Next, of course, we need to understand how to tackle all of those other references, right? Uh, as you recall, there were many references, like I think 12 or 13, to deck underscore conf. And ideally, we'd like to capture all of these encoded values that are pointed to by the second argument and then use the deck underscore conf uh, algorithm implemented there, uh, use it against itself to actually decode those values. Now, we could kind of by hand choose each set of addresses. Uh, of course, that can get rather tedious. So a better approach here is now to really rely upon a disassembler API, right? So we're obviously using Ghidra. Ghidra has uh, Python bindings, and we can perhaps use those Python bindings to then go ahead and find references to deck underscore conf, work our way backwards to collect all of the arguments, and then emulate each pair of start and end addresses. Okay, so that's kind of the next step. Now, of course, this relies upon you being a little familiar with a disassembler API, whether it's IDAs or Ghidra's. But in this case, of course, I'm going to go with Ghidra. And so what I have here now is a version of that script I built upon it in order to now deobfuscate all strings referenced and processed by deck underscore conf. So similar to the previous six script, right? We got the same initialization here. We got the same population of EBP. Now here at the outset, I specify the end address, right? Because now I'm working with multiple pairs. And so I'm going to specify the, the end address here. Okay, and you'll see why that is in just a moment. I'm then going to create this uh, list where I'm going to place all of my decoded strings. And now is where I start the process uh, using Ghidra's API of determining all the references to deck underscore conf. Now, what I've done is I've hard-coded here the address of that function. And maybe somebody, some people, even in the last example, are kind of thinking, well, this is a little weak, right? We're hard coding addresses. I want to be clear that obviously I'm introducing everyone here to this concept. So that's why I'm hard coding the addresses. But there is kind of a next level to this. Uh, we're not going to explore that here together today. But for example, you could use Yara Python to create a Yara rule for the decoding function and then use that to identify the offset where the function uh, resides. And then you wouldn't have to actually uh, hard code any of these addresses. So that is an that's option smart. available. Yeah, yeah, that would totally work. So <clears throat> here we're basically now using Ghidra's API to uh, take this address, right, convert it to the appropriate address object, get references to that address. And then for each reference, we got a for loop here, right? For each reference to the address, we're going to get essentially uh, the address of that reference. And then what I do here is I basically go backwards for instructions, right? As a reminder, with each call, to deck underscore conf, there are four instructions I need to collect that are above that call. So this code that I'm uh, introducing here right now, all it does, let me just scroll up a little bit here. All it does is it basically goes up four instructions. It gets the offset of that instruction that is four instructions up, and that's gonna be our start address. So we now have a start address for a particular reference. We've already hard-coded the end address, and now we just gotta end Before it'll go ahead and read the contents of the AX, dereference the string, and then append that to our list of strings. If I scroll down, I just got some code down here to actually print out all of those decoded strings. Okay, and that's that's really it. So now I've used Ghidra's API. Now, 
because I'm in VS Code right now, which I like because it's got the syntax highlighting and all that goodness, unfortunately, I can't actually run this script from VS Code because it requires a Ghidra API. So I need to really be in the context of Ghidra to use this. One approach is to copy and paste this code into Ghidra's script manager. But the approach that I prefer these days is to use Ghidra's uh, headless analyzer, right? Mm -hmm. Which allows me to run scripts against loaded programs from the command line. And so that's what we're gonna do here today. Now there are two steps to using Ghidra's headless analyzer. First, you actually have to, of course, tell Ghidra to process the file, right? It's gotta do its pre-processing to understand code, data, and all that goodness. And then you can run the script against it. Uh, so my preference is to, you know, rather than do all that in one command line, to first process the file and then run a script. Because if my script has errors or there's an issue, it allows me to kind of rapidly troubleshoot those. Now, it does, uh, for those of you who have had experience with Ghidra, it does take a few minutes for it to load code. So rather than do that here and make us wait five minutes for that, uh, what I'm just going to show you is the command line that I've already run. So this is a command line that I ran earlier. It's the headless analyzer. And all this really does is it imports this elf binary. Okay, that's all it really did. And now the script that I'm going to run right here is responsible for actually running a script. And it's going to run this XOR DDoS decrypt config, right? Which should hopefully decrypt all of the strings now that are embedded and processed by deck underscore conf. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this now. And this might take a little bit of time to run. Although sometimes they get lucky and it runs uh, faster than others. So again, this depends on having already processed a file with Ghidra. And now it's going to go ahead and actually run this script through. It's going to go ahead and actually run this um, against it. Oh, and that happened pretty quick that time. So lucky nice. us. And what we can see here is all the decoded strings now that are processed by deck underscore conf. Now we got that uh, URL right here referencing the raw file, but we also got some other ones here that are various locations on the Linux file system that it uses as part of its enumeration. That's so cool. Yeah, I've never so used Ghidra in, in that headless analyzer before, but I think that's awesome. I always, uh, binary ninja, I know, and I think is another good one for a lot of scripting, but being able to do that in the at least the Ghidra ecosystem is still super cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and um, you know, Binary Ninja one, I bet you I'm sure you can do stuff like this there too. I've been eager to dig into that, but I haven't made the time just yet. Uh, but yeah, using the headless analyzers when you're scripting is is pretty clutch uh, and very, very helpful. So and I want to stress here, right? So we emulated the execution of a Linux binary, right? It was an elf binary on my Windows system. And we deobfuscated the string without all of these strings, without looking at really any details associated with the actual algorithm. And, and keep in mind, you know, from version to version of malware, sometimes the algorithms change, right? So if you've created your standalone Python script, you find out it doesn't work. All right, now you got to kind of re-implement it. Hopefully it didn't get too, more, too much more complicated. But when you're using emulation, you really don't care about the algorithm. Right? And especially if you're combining it with Yara Python, this could work against various versions or variants of this malware, even if the algorithm changes. So very powerful, I think. All right. Now we've looked at stack strings. We've looked at an elf binary. We're going to get into our final example that I want to show you. And we're going to tackle this one, which is going to be a little different. So in this next scenario, we're going to look at a Windows executable that deobfuscates and executes the next stage Windows executable in memory. And uh, this one is called bacon.exe. So hopefully you had breakfast by now, John, otherwise you might be getting hungry here. Uh, I'm gonna throw this into PE Studio, which is uh, one of my go-to tools for individual file analysis when dealing with Windows executables. So you can see here, we got a 64-bit uh, uh, executable here. And what I want to show you as soon as it loads, which sometimes takes a moment, is I'm going to take a look at the imports because, of course, looking at the import address table, the list of dependencies is a very common approach to doing a Windows file analysis to understand and maybe come up with some theories about what the sample is capable of doing. And I'm going to sort by flag here, which kind of brings to my attention APIs of particular interest in the context of malware analysis. And you'll see that there are a couple virtual APIs here, right? And as you may know, John, right, these virtual APIs are interacting with memory. Virtual alloc allocates memory. Virtual protect modifies the permission of a region in memory. So these are APIs that are commonly of interest to malware analysts because when these are called, we want to know why is memory being allocated? And Spooky stuff is happening. <laughs> exactly, right? And in particular with virtual protect, if the permissions are being changed to something executable, 
that is of great interest to us. So let's let's go ahead and check out virtual protect in particular. We're going to do some brief debugging here. I'm going to toss bacon.exe to x64 debug. And I'm going to do a little window resizing here. We don't need to see the opcodes. And what I'm going to do is go down to the command window, and I'm going to use the BP command to set a breakpoint on virtual protect. So I got that command in there. I'm going to hit enter on my keyboard. There we go. Breakpoint has been set. I'm now going to run the code. It's running. It's paused on virtual protect now. All right. So with virtual protect, there are a couple arguments I want to focus on. First, this first argument, which on the right-hand side, if I look at the middle of the screen, this represents all the arguments that are being passed to virtual protect. The first one specifies the starting address of a region in memory. The third one that I want to focus on here today, this third argument, is a memory protection constant. It specifies the new memory uh, permission that is being applied. And I think I have this page up here. If I go to Microsoft's list of memory protection constants, right? This is what the top of the page looks like. If I scroll down, hex 20 corresponds with page execute read. The key word, of course, being execute. Right. So we're interested in execution as a malware analyst. And so we might ask ourselves, well, what is being updated to have executable permissions? If I right click on this first one, which should be an address in memory, I can follow it in the dump window, which is on the bottom left. And I see here, if I look at the ASCII, or you can, if, if you've done this before, you recognize 4U5A, this looks like a Windows executable. And if I scroll down, I start to see the, uh, uh, this program cannot be run in DOS mode, references to the rich and the PE header, and you know various sections. So all right, this is starting to look kind of like a Windows executable. And I could further evaluate that by dumping this to disk. I could right click here in the dump window, follow it in the memory map, and then dump this down to disk by doing dump memory to file. I'll place this on my desktop here. And if I go to my desktop, here is that file that I just dumped. I could toss it into PE Studio and confirm is this an executable? And of course, we would find that, yes, it is, in fact, an executable. Some of you may recognize this uh, export name here, beacon.dll. <laughs> uh, also, this export name, reflective loader. So this, as you, some of you may have guessed by now, is a Cobalt Strike beacon, the ultimate kind of payload associated with Cobalt Strike that provides command and control. So it turns out this, this, this uh, bacon.exe is, in fact, a Cobalt Strike loader. Okay, that was a cool exercise. What was the point? Well, from an emulation perspective, we might ask ourselves, how do we automate the deobfuscation and dumping of this binary? Well, we can do that with emulation. Now, when you implement emulation, especially based on a process like this, always got to ask ourselves, what is the manual approach that we just went through? Well, to recap, I loaded this into x64 debug, I set a breakpoint on virtual protect, and then I dumped basically the address specified by the first argument. Okay, so that's the approach we want to take. And killing allows us to hook, or as it calls in its documentation, hijack an API. And that's exactly what we want to do here. We want to basically create a killing script such that whenever virtual protect is called, we're able to insert code of our choosing. And that code will ideally dump that memory region down to disk. So let me show you a script that allows us to achieve something like this. And we're going to take this in really two stages, and I'll, I'll clarify that as we move along. Now, you'll see that this killing script has some more imports here. Uh, these are necessary to perform the hooking or hijacking necessary in this case. Uh, you'll see that we have the initialization of killing right here. I have added an optional well, an option to the initialization here, debug. You'll see that's going to become useful in this particular case because we are going to hit an issue here, John. And the issue here is that one of the functions is not going to be implemented, but that gives us an opportunity to talk about a limitation of emulation frameworks, which is that as hard as they try to get this program actually running, sometimes an API is not implemented. As you can imagine, there are a lot of APIs, uh, for example, in Windows. And it's you know most of these frameworks are provided for free and they are supported by the community. And so it's impossible to have all Windows APIs emulated. So inevitably, if you work with emulation frameworks long enough, you'll hit some APIs that are not implemented. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about here today. But for starters, let's now go ahead and talk about how we're going to hook virtual protect. And if you haven't dealt with uh, this sort of Python code before, I understand it's a little complicated. You might have to watch this part a few times and do some additional digging. But what we are taking advantage of here in Python is a decorator. 
And a decorator basically provides a wrapper to a function. It allows us to uh, go ahead and extend or modify the behavior of a function. And that's exactly what we want to do with virtual protect. We want to intercept that API and then do something a little bit different with it. And what we want to do is dump the code that's pointed to by the first argument. So this function right here, hook underscore VP, is our handler function. It's what we want to execute whenever virtual protect is actually called. So what this does is it basically reads from memory using the mem.read method. It's, it uses the address uh, provided to virtual protect and it uses the size, which is actually the second argument passed to virtual protect. And then it just creates a file on disk and it writes to it. That's all it does. And then we basically stop our emulation with this code right here because we don't need to go any further once we've dumped it down to disk. And then it prints out the name of the created file. Now, that's kind of the setup for hooking or hijacking API. All we have to do then is use the set underscore API method in killing to go ahead and place our hook. So we specify that we're hooking virtual protect and the function to execute whenever, whenever virtual protect is called is hook underscore VP, which is what I showed earlier. And then we just run the emulation. Now you'll notice something very different about this run here. It doesn't specify a starter and address. This is risky. Right? But sometimes, like in this case, it's worthwhile to consider. Just remember that if you run it without a start and end address, you are more likely to encounter APIs that are not implemented. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, run this now. Let me double check here. It looks like we are good. And uh, this might take a moment to run, John, but let's see if we get lucky as we did with the previous case. And what you'll see here is there's a lot of work that is happening here. Right, You're going to see all sorts of references to Windows DLL has been being loaded. You'll see some red exclamation marks sometimes that are kind of scary. And we need to remind ourselves that the goal of emulation is really to fake out the malware, right? Or whatever program you're running. It's just to get it to work. So sometimes emulators, when they see an API being called, they'll just do like a return zero. Like, hey, that's Sweet. fine. You're good. <laughs> yeah. Because the goal is just to get it to run. But of course, depending upon the importance of that API, uh, you might have a failure if the API is very important and it's not implemented either properly or completely. So what we'll see as this continues to kind of uh, uh, move on here is that we will encounter an issue uh, with Sprintf in particular, uh, a function called Sprintf, which creates a formatted string. And then we'll have to investigate that. So just to kind of speed up this work here a little bit that we're doing here together, John, I'm going to let that finish. But in the meantime, since I've given you a hint that it will tell us there's a problem with the Sprintf method, let me go ahead and jump here into Ghidra open up bacon.exe and talk a little bit about what I would do next when I encounter an issue with a specific function. So as I mentioned, sprintf is going to be the problem here. And uh, I have the actually the only call to sprintf is right here. So essentially, right, I got the program loaded in Ghidra. I'd want to find out how this API is actually being used, in this case, sprintf. And the reason is because how it's being used will inform how I implement uh, or, or the API. Because if I can determine precisely, that can really shortcut my process for implementing an API. Let me show you what I mean. Sprintf takes a number of arguments, but the two most important ones are one, the address where it's going to place the formatted string, and then the actual format of the string. So rdx, which is the second argument, this is going to contain the format of the string. So some of you may have seen this format before associated with Cobalt Strike. And then this, this address, which is placing an RCX, is going to be the address of the formatted string. So the question is, what is it using this formatted string for? Well, if I look for references to the string, I'll see that there are three. We're just going to focus on the first one here today. So I'm going to click on this first location. And what I'll learn as I start looking through this code, which I'm not going to get into detail here today, but what you'll learn is that this formatted string is actually used to create a named pipe, right? So named pipes are often used for inter-process communication in the context of malware. Malware often uses it uh, to communicate within a process or between processes as a way to evade detection and analysis. So what ends up happening if you spend some more time with this sample is it creates a named pipe using the name specified or output by sprintf. It then connects to that named pipe it then writes some content to that named pipe. That turns out to be some encoded content. And later on in the code, not in this function, but elsewhere, I had to read the contents from that named pipe, decode it, and that's what we actually ended up seeing in our debugger. 
that that virtual protect was referencing. Okay, so that's how named pipes are actually uh, used here. Now, quick spoiler alert, again, just to save us a little bit of time, even if you implemented the sprintf method, you would find another error uh, we would encounter, and that would be that create named pipe, unfortunately, uh, is not implemented. So we'd have to implement this as well. So let me jump now to the code that actually does all this and uh, show you how we're going to finish up this example here. And this, you can see this is still running. So we'll let that uh, continue as it might. And what I'm also going to do is, uh, yeah, I'm just going to minimize this for now. We'll come back to that later. All right. So this is, see, I got my, mostly my typical imports here at the top. I got my initialization for killing. And I now have my implementation of these APIs. And you'll see that they really resemble my virtual protect hook. In fact, they're hooks themselves. So I now have three hooks in this file, one for sprint F, one for create named pipe A, and one for virtual protect, okay? And this might be a little distracting. Let me make that a little bit smaller down here. All right, so let me quickly walk through what we are looking at here. And there we go. So that just errored out, by the way. <laughs> and just to quickly show you, if I scroll up here. Yeah, I saw some of those Python errors that choked. Yep, a lot of errors. There we go. We got our sprint app exception, right? So this would be our indication that uh, something something is awry. All right. So just to briefly touch on this script. So this is our sprint f hook, and it relies upon the knowledge that I just discussed, which is basically that it's going to place at a location in memory a string. And so all I did here is I said, all right, let me go ahead and just write a string to that location in memory. And that's all I'm doing here. I'm writing the string pipe underscore file to essentially the first argument passed to sprint f. Okay, still using my win SDK API decorator. That's really all this, this, this hook does. And that's based on my knowledge of how this actually works uh, within the context of this network. And finally, I have my create named pipe a hook. And this again, I had to kind of think creatively about how to implement this. One approach is to actually try and implement named pipes. It's unnecessary though. Remember that all our, uh, we're trying to do here is fake out the malware. Well, as you may know, Named pipes are, uh, are you, you can essentially interact with named pipes similar to how you would interact with a file. You can use write file, read file, and so on. Is rather than worried about the actual concept of named pipes, I used the internal. And I basically just passed it arguments associated with uh, a create file. That's what I'm specifying right here. So, you know, some details here, when you hook a function, you provide a dictionary of parameters. And so that's what I'm doing here, just specifying some of the basic parameters for create file. But the bottom line here is I just created a file in the root FS and this allows it to proceed with execution. So I got my sprint F, sprint F hook, got my create named pipe hook, got my virtual protect hook already. All that's left now at the bottom is I got to hijack all three of those APIs. And then I can go ahead and run this emulation. So I'm going to do that here now. Let's go ahead and run this. And the ultimate uh, uh, goal here, of course, is to just create that dumped file on disk. So John, this, this might take a minute or two to run, as we can see with the prior ones as well. The difference, though, the reason this might run a little faster is I use the debug previous script uh, in order to debug the issues with SprintF. And uh, in this uh, newer script, I took that out just to make it uh, go a little bit faster. So hopefully nice. this doesn't take a whole lot of time. Um, but yeah, the ultimate goal here will be that we have a dumped file on disk that is essentially identical to the file that we dumped from x64 debug, essentially thereby automating that process. Hey man, this is incredible. Like it's so cool to, I don't know, wrestle and grapple with the binary and then just put it together in even a simple Python script that'll have all this power with some of those emulation frameworks. And I had no idea, like I didn't even realize Unicorn could do that so, so easily. I know, okay, it could, there's potential there, but killing I'd never heard of. And this is just mind blowing to me. So fantastic stuff. Uh, hey, how can folks kind of learn a little bit more? I, I think you've got tons of videos just like this on your channel. Is that right? Yeah, I'm working on it and always open to suggestions. So definitely do check out my channel. Just look for my name, Anuj Sony, A-N-U-J-S-O-N-I. Uh, you can certainly reach out to me on, on Twitter or X or Twix, as I like to call it, <laughs> if you like as well. But yeah, always open to connecting with anybody. Uh, I'm in the DC area, so would love to meet more people in the community who like and enjoy, uh, want to learn more about malware analysis. 
Uh, but yeah, man, super excited to be here. I want to thank you so much for the opportunity. What do you think? Will we uh, see this file pulled out? That's that's the uh, depends on us how long we're willing to wait here. I think it's going to take like uh, I think it's going to take another thirty seconds. Okay, cool. It's 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 going to get there. <laughs> and then if, if we have a moment, if you have a moment, then I can do a, a quick comparison with the file that we dumped uh, earlier, and you'll find there to be just one interesting observation that I do want to make. Ooh, would you mind just kind of talking about it? Um... Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, when we dump this down, what we're going to find, and actually, let me bring up a PE Studio here. So this is the file that we dumped earlier manually using the debugger. And what you might notice among the many reds and yellows here on the left-hand side is that there is an overlay, right? So an overlay is data that occurs after the file should have technically ended. And this is not unusual when you are debugger because we weren't very precise about it. We just dump the whole memory region. So it doesn't mean there's anything malicious or, unu or unusual there. It's just really some additional content that you'll generally have when you dump a memory region down to disk. Well, the good thing about programmatically, uh, and this could apply to even a static Python script too, but the good thing about programmatically uh, and automatically extracting the underlying information the way we just did is we took advantage of the size, right? Which is the second argument passed to virtual protect. And by doing so in our script, uh, we're going to extract exactly the amount of content we need, right? So just to clarify that, if I go here to my virtual protect hook. I took advantage of the DW size argument, the second argument passed to virtual protect, and I used that when I read from memory. So again, this just means I am now surgically and precisely dumping the next stage X down to disk. And, you know, ideally that's preferred to then just to, to just dumping the entire memory region. So that was kind of one comparison uh, that I like to call out because uh, we end up with not only, you know, the same executable content within this dump file, but actually uh, a more precise file dumped down to disk. That's so cool. Yeah. And this is, they're, they're, it's plain hard to get, John, this script. <laughs> it's just really, really making us work for it here. Well, I got to be super honest. I do got to run. I uh, have some other reporter Absolutely. call super I'm duper quick, uh, but I'm trusting that that will, uh, Turn out another incredible malicious cobalt strike binary. <laughs> it will. It's going to turn out that 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 beacon. And uh, yeah, if we did comparisons, section hashes, all that stuff, uh, you'll find that it is. Uh, oh, here we go. We're like ten seconds out now. I think. Cool. Virtual alloc. It's at virtual alloc. It's allocated space for that next stage binary. So it is very very close. Well, hey, if you're up for it, I would love to do this again. Uh, if there's sure. anything else that you, any other magic tricks or some cool things to showcase, I think this would be phenomenal. Uh, but it's whatever you're comfortable with. I think this uh, is a, a, such a fascinating topic. And it's very, very cool to see it kind of boiled down to like, look at how easily and accessible this can be if you want to go play with it in Python. So Yeah, I would love to come back if you have me, John. And there it is, by the way. Okay, so created that file on disk. That file is going to be here in my RAM folder here. Got it right here. And so again, if you did a side-by-side -side with this file and the file that we dumped manually, you'd find it to be exactly the same, except for the fact that this one would not have an overlay because it's not needed. And we kind of dumped that based on using the, the size past to virtual protect. Absolute magic. Very, very cool. <laughs> Well, hey, we'll tune out here, but thank you again and again, my friend. This has been so cool and I'm excited to learn even more. <laughs> Absolutely, John. Thanks for having me. You take care.